Welcome to our latest Find Home Building webinar, Building Homes to Survive Wildfires. I'm Rob, Rob Watsek, editor of FindHomeBuilding.com. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsor, Rockwell, for making this webinar possible. Rockwell is committed to reducing the human and economic loss associated with fire through long-term partnerships with fire safety organizations. Uh, they advocate for new fire safety technologies and stronger fire safety regulations based on research and real-world experience. And Rockwell's non-combustible stone wool insulation plays a crucial role in improving the fire resistance of buildings and can even help limit the spread of fire. Now, uh, you've probably read in the when you registered for the event that our presentation today will uh, feature architect David Arkin, who will include a, in, in this presentation firsthand what it's like to lose a home to wildfire, what, is, what the recovery process is like, and how architects and builders can create homes that are safer and more resilient to the threats of these disasters. Uh, David is um, AI, David Arkin AA lead AP and his wife, Ani Tilt, are principals of Northern California-based Arkintilt Architects. Uh, David's a native of Wisconsin and studied architecture at the University of Minnesota and UC Berkeley. And he's the co-director of the California Straw Building Association, advocating to bring natural building methods into building codes. David serves on the AIA's um, 2030 Commitment Working Group, and he and Chris Magwood are co-chairs of the Carbon Leadership Forum's Renewable Materials Focus Group. Arkintilk has several dozen projects that have either survived a wildfire or are designed and built following one. Oh, thanks, David, for being here with us. Yeah, great. Happy to be here. Uh, I just, oh, go ahead. Uh, so I just wanted to mention following David's talk, we'll be joined by Rick Ruse, the Senior Manager of Code Standards and Fire Safety at Rockwell, for a discussion on material standards and building practices appropriate to wildfire regions. Thanks for joining us, Rick. My pleasure. Thanks, sir. Um, so, Rick uses his expertise in fire safety, hydrothermal building performance, and acoustic control to bring a holistic approach to codes and standards uh, development process in the International Code Council. So, he'll bring a lot of insight to this conversation after we hear uh, David's presentation. Uh, so, Rick and I are going to go uh, wait in the wings uh, as David uh, opens up his slideshow, and we'll be back soon for uh, a good discussion. All right, thank you, Rob. And I really am happy to be here. It's a nice, cool day here in Northern California. A friend of mine set, uh, sent a picture from the Tahoe fire alert cam that shows snow at the higher elevations, which means a little bit of rain uh, further below. And we can pray that uh, this is a harbinger of a early end to the wildfire season. Uh, so over the past few weeks, as I've been preparing this, I've uh, asked many very smart people, you know, what their tips would be. And invariably, the first one I get is that, well, just don't build in a high risk fire zone. And I guess it's worth mentioning uh, right off that we do have choices about where we choose to build. Um, but we'll discuss today, when we do choose to build in a high risk zone, what are some of the methods that can help us survive? Um, another person said, you know, don't build with sticks, surround it with tinder and fuel, uh, pump flammable gas into it and expect it to uh, survive a wildfire. And uh, it's basically to say, you know, we can't do what we've been doing in many cases and expect a different result. And finally, and I think this may be the most important tip of all, you know, don't let your guard down. Um, through design, through construction, and through every day it's not raining, you have to be alert. Um, so it's evident that um, this is an increasingly important and urgent topic, and um, it's one that we didn't necessarily set out to focus on, uh, but it's turned into something that uh, is very current in our work. Um, and, and why is it evident that this is so important? Um, well, heat means a dry climate, means wildfire. And uh, this is an issue for anyone that's really anywhere in North America and throughout the world. Um, you know, climate change is bringing unpredictable extremes um, like we've never seen them before. And that was uh, especially true in British Columbia this past uh, summer 
when they recorded the highest temperature ever. And the following day, the town of Lytton was pretty much wiped off the map. And we know that there are other places that have been similarly devastated and there has been loss of life. So this is a very urgent and important topic. Um, Paradise and Grizzly Flat here in California to mention a few. Um, we're now in our second year of drought here in California. I live in that dark red spot um, uh, close to the Bay Area and really throughout the West we're experiencing uh, different rainfall patterns and this is not uh, exclusive to California. We have um, uh, recent reports that Wyoming and Idaho are equally and similarly at risk. I have to see if I can move this toolbar um, that's over the top of my slide. So bear with me a moment. So my own um, personal journey with fire started when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley and uh, witnessed from um, the roof of our warehouse, the East Bay Hills uh, under fire and afterwards um, traveling up there and uh, observing what's, what burned and what didn't. And uh, actually in subsequent years have had done some uh, work up in that region. More recently, um, we were in Sonoma County in 2015 and witnessed the plume of smoke rising out of uh, Lake County to our north uh, over Mount St. Helena. And um, the devastation that followed there, the loss of structures inspired our firm to take a number of the uh, modest straw bale home plans that we've been developing uh, under a, a program of limited services to sell on the internet and made them available to free along with our structural engineering partners uh, to victims of, of wildfires. And I'm happy to say that a number of these were um, uh, taken up and a few people hired us to make modifications uh, to them and in a couple cases design completely new projects. Uh, this is um, uh, the project that Rob mentioned um, that we lost. Uh, my wife's family and a great number of cousins uh, shared a cabin that their grandmother built. Um, this is in Sonoma County. And I, if I still had this structure, I would have walked around and taken photographs of so many of the things to not do. Um, we, as we watched the fires burn in 2015, took action in 2016 to put a new fire resistant um, non-vented roof on the structure. Um, with the, the, the first step of many, we also improved uh, defensible space. In 2017, while we were up in Oregon, um, ironically teaching a straw bale building workshop in the rain, uh, the Tubbs fire, ripped through Northern California from Calistoga to Santa Rosa. And um, we watched in horror as the, you know, the news came in and subsequently was able to visit some of these places, um, but watched the map to see if uh, our place was gonna be uh, survive, survive or not. The uh, fire started on Sunday night and it wasn't until Friday that a little flame icon popped up uh, in what appeared to be right at our place. Um, and indeed it was. But at that time of the week, the winds had died down and fire crews had been mobilized um, and uh, the houses uh, by some good fortune were saved. And after that fire walking through the, the trees that had burned, um, it really hit me that, oh yeah, this place burns. It's burned in the past and it's gonna burn again. And um, we, uh, we didn't, what we didn't expect is that um, three years later, uh, the glass fire, which similarly started near Calistoga or actually closer to St. Helena in Napa County, in four hours uh, traveled 20 miles and um, came right through those trees that had burned previously three years earlier and sent a shower of embers onto our, our cabin. And I lied awake a few nights wondering, I wonder what the one thing that started that fire was. And I wish I had a webcam or something to tell me, but then it occurred to me, it was dozens of things at once that likely started that fire. So, um, uh, you know, we, uh, 
we have learned a few things over the years in uh, the work that we've been doing. And um, I will try to share a few of the things that we've observed that work and some of the other things that uh, are out there in a lot of written documentation. Worth noting is that um, the, the site planning considerations are extremely important. Um, it's the place to start. It's not really the focus of what we're talking about here today, but it's something that must be included. Um, you know, I've observed a lot of houses that were still standing um, and you would look at their detailing and say, how is that building still there? Um, but it had a lot to do with its siting and with its defensible space. Um, a builder friend uh, who has also seen many of these fires said that you must take a holistic approach. You can't just do one thing and think that you're going to survive. So it's important to understand uh, something about how wildfires move through the topography. And in the absence of strong winds, they will generally move upslope and steep upslopes are even more dangerous. Um, other landforms can create chimney effects that really funnel the, um, the fire and the heat. Uh, so setbacks are important. We'll talk about that in a minute. And a lot of the um, defensible zones describe a fourth zone that isn't typically uh, talked about, which is your driveway and maintaining um, clearance and thinking about what the fire is going to do along your driveway. So how do homes burn? Uh, there are generally recognized um, three different ways. Um, one is through direct flame contact where flammable materials along the ground plane um, allow the, the, the flames to reach the face of the building and ultimately ignite it. Uh, the second is blowing embers. Um, that night that our place burned, I tuned into a webcam on the ridge and it looked like a hurricane, um, but it was actually raindrops worth of embers being blown at 70 miles per hour. Um, so in those conditions, you have to think about every little place that one of those embers might land and uh, have enough foothold to start a fire, especially when it's being fueled by a lot of oxygen. And the third is radiant heat. And this is uh, of particular concern in more urban environments and why complete neighborhoods like Coffee Park um, were devastated was that once one uh, structure was ignited, its heat was then transferred to the next one. Um, so those are the primary reasons why homes burn or how homes burn. And we'll talk uh, through the rest of this uh, discussion about all the different ways that they can survive. Um, starting with defensible space. And there are a, an incredible number of resources available out there um, for tips on generating um, defensible space. And I just want to touch on a lot of the commonalities among them. So they're often described as having zones. The one that's closest to your home is where you pretty much want to have a non-combustible or minimally landscaped zone um, with hardscape or gravel. And I must emphasize uh, no mulch whatsoever. Then in the uh, next zone, which is commonly called lean and green, um, a place to limit your planting to roughly 20%. I want to mention this is also a good place to have something like a vegetable garden where it's being irrigated regularly and will actually serve as more of a fire break than a fuel source. And then finally, in that outer zone, reducing fuel and uh, in particular trees where canopies don't touch. And if you're in a forested area and you have the ability to actually increasing that um, to the degree possible. A lot of this information is uh, discussed in detail in an article that Scott Gibson prepared for fine home building um, that we contributed to back in April, May of 2018. So uh, I believe there may be a link uh, available to that uh, today as well. In one of our projects, we actually looked to the driveway, not only as a source of access and providing uh, turnaround space for fire equipment, which is typically going to be mandated no matter where you're building, uh, but also realized that by wrapping this around the building, it could actually serve as a form of defensible space so that if a fire is moving along the ground plane, it would reach this um, barrier. 
We also had in this case, the ability to bring water uh, immediately adjacent to the building. So we have um, the outdoor deck here adjacent to a small pond. And then this deck is above the driveway. Uh, so no combustible materials beneath it. A couple rules when it comes to outbuildings and firewood storage. Uh, the 30 foot rule is to try to maintain structures with at least 30 uh, feet of separation between them. Um, that's a way where we can um, prevent that radiant heat from being transferred from one to the next. Firewood storage should be kept uh, also 30 feet away from the building and feature a 10 foot bare dirt circle around it. There are also fire resistant tarps available. Uh, in some counties, these are actually mandated. Um, putting it in a fireproof enclosure is an even better um, a solution. And one of our favorite go-to materials these days is uh, watershed block, which is a compressed earth block. Um, that uh, is uh, very non-combustible. Uh, throughout the talk here, I'm going to share some survival stories. And this first one um, is a project we did many, many years ago up in um, the town of Shasta, California to the west of Redding. Um, and here our clients had a lovely little knoll. And rather than building on top of the knoll, we chose to put the vegetable garden on top here and then sort of string the building in a, a sloped ramp along the backside um, and with a series of pavilions. Um, just before the car fire in 2018, our clients had done a defensible space trimming and limbing of trees and other measures. Um, the fire came from the north and um, they described how, uh, at least as far as they could tell, it basically went over the top of the knoll and over their house. A number of neighboring homes were lost, but um, by some good fortune, sighting and again, timely creation of defensible space, um, they survived. Um, they provided these photos of the landscape immediately adjacent the building. And I think it's interesting to note that where they are landscaped, uh, it's a very water rich and heavily irrigated um, zone with, uh, a, again, trying to hit that uh, maximum 20% um, landscaped uh, with plant vegetation material. I want to mention that a good number of us, the majority of us live in urban areas and some of these um, are in very fire prone regions and communities are becoming fire adapted. So if you're living in one of these spaces, be sure to get involved um, with your local community and um, work with your neighbors, uh, work together to create a fire safe landscape and other uh, plans. Okay. This brings us now to the um, heart of our discussion here today. And um, we will try to illustrate some of the designs and details that we found through our work um, are actually effective. Um, by no means is there everything to know uh, going to be presented here today, um, nor am I going to share all the options that are out there. Um, but I do hope to show uh, that you don't need to build a concrete bunker uh, in order to be safe. And really, you really wouldn't want to live in a concrete bunker anyways. Um, so this is not the only old way to build, but this is an illustration of a lot of the features that you might find in a lot of homes that um, have been built over the years here in North America. Uh, typically a raised, um, wood frame floor over a crawl space with vents. Um, many people store their firewood right next to the building. Um, we have curtains over our windows. We have um, siding directly over uh, sheathing and we have um, often lighter framing and wood shake roofs in our buildings. And we prepared a little illustration that shows one of many versions of the new ways to build. Um, so not every new home is going to be straw bale construction as much as I might hope, but there are many elements here that are important from the class A roof to the uh, limited um, or elimination of crawl space fence and um, other uh, details that we'll get into some uh, detail about right now. The um, 
the codes here in California since uh, 2007 have defined what they call the wildland urban interface zones or WUI, and there are maps that show these. Um, and these have been uh, part of our code since 2007. Uh, remarkably, other states and provinces uh, don't seem to have this code. So I am inviting all of you who are not here in California to look this up and put it to use in your um, building projects. The State Fire Marshal's office keeps a um, running list of the um, approved uh, systems um, and uh, building materials. And so that's another great source that you all should be uh, looking to. Which brings us to our second survival story. And this one is the first home that we designed to the new WUI standards in, the, uh, in around 2010. And um, I wanna note that up to this point, we had been designing projects with uh, what was sort of a fun feature at the time, which was horizontal wood cribbing. Um, and uh, with the WUI code, we realized that is really not the thing to do. So this is horizontal uh, sheet metal that encloses uh, the small deck portion of the building, but the rest of the outdoor space here is patio slab on grade and all of the um, exterior framing and uh, roof overhangs are heavy timber. So nothing smaller than a four by four uh, piece of wood on this project. In 2017, um, as part of the Nuns Complex fire, uh, the same one that um, threatened our place, uh, firefighters were again on site, is actually only a mile away, and uh, they were able to pr protect it and uh, it survived. And then in the same 2020 glass fire, it was not uh, protected by fire crews, but the occupants by maintaining defensible space and I think the fact that it's located in a bit of a valley, so it wasn't subject to the high winds and ember load that we experienced, it was able to survive again. Um, moving to roofing materials, and I've illustrated a few uh, here from uh, terracotta tile to metal roofing, uh, but there are a good number of other systems, composition shingles and whatnot that are available in um, a class A rating. And you, uh, for wildfire areas, only want to be working with a class A roofing system. Um, it's important to note that valleys and wall to roof connections represent places where debris can build up and represent a threat. And in general, simple roof forms are going to be better in these wildfire prone areas. I'll mention with metal roofing, it uh, is important to include a underlayment that uh, improves the fire rating uh, of that material. While we don't do a lot of enclosed eaves, eaves do represent one of the most susceptible areas, especially if they feature vents. Um, so enclosing the soffit with fire resistant non-combustible materials is important. And in some extreme cases, actually having a uh, curved, uh, uh, taking the stucco up the wall and actually curving it out to the eave of the roof is something that uh, I've seen recommended. In our own practice, we, tend to um, uh, favor using a heavy timber, again, nothing smaller than a four by for the overhang uh, extensions, and then um, capping this with the metal roofing and leaving the underside of the metal roofing exposed. And um, we've had several of our survivors um, featuring that particular system. You'll notice in this example over on the left, um, we actually have no eave. And while that is uh, certainly an option for limiting the susceptibility of eaves, it doesn't do much for solar control. And you'll see on this project, we actually feature light shelves uh, that are covered in fiber cement in order to um, protect uh, the framing below. Uh, gutters represent uh, a space uh, where uh, leaves and other debris can build up and become a source for ignition and fire. 
Um, when you have gutters, it's important to have covers. These are actually mandated uh, in the WUI code here in California. Um, gutters are good for rainwater collection. So if you're doing that, you're gonna want to have them. Um, however, if you're not letting the water fall onto the ground where you likely have uh, gravel ground playing anyways is a wonderful solution to consider. Uh, just take the gutters off the building altogether. So to summarize some of the roof recommendations, uh, simple, using class A materials, eliminating gutters and increasing the size and the spacing between uh, your framing members. Um, next to talk a bit about uh, vents. And you know, one of the reasons that we have vents uh, in our buildings, our attics is uh, because they're, they're part of the building system. They, uh, allow cooling of that space, uh, moisture control, and other things. And the vast majority of houses built um, feature ventilated attics. So using ember safe vents, uh, Vulcan vent is one product, but there are many others out there, um, or having closable vents either with louvers or just fabricating your own covers that can be quickly and easily deployed uh, are important um, means of keeping those blowing embers out. Um, one of the uh, techniques that we often use, because we do believe in the cooling effect of a ventilated roof, it's what we call an ice house. Um, back in Wisconsin, when they would cut the ice off the lakes, they would pack it in sawdust, and then the ice house actually had two roofs. So the upper one would shade the lower roof, and they would move air uh, between the two to keep that heat from transferring. Um, when we use these, this is an infrared photograph and you can actually see along the ridge vent, um, the heat that's coming out of that while the roof itself is kept quite a bit cooler. Um, the Vulcan vent makes a strip version which we employ for these ice house roofs. And uh, the way this works is there's a honeycomb behind the perforated metal there. And that is coated with an intumescent paint coating. So if it's exposed to heat, or embers, um, that intimescent coating swells and seals off the, uh, the opening. Better still is to find alternates to venting altogether, either a conditioned attic um, where you're sheathing at the roof plane and then making it part of the conditioned space. Uh, and similarly, crawl spaces are other areas where um, actually during some of the um, uh, Santa Rosa fires, people observed uh, embers blowing along the ground, blowing into crawl space vents and then uh, exiting as flame out the other side of the building. So a conditioned crawl space where the uh, floor of the ground plane is sealed and then insulated and connected to the home itself is a great solution. Um, one that we employ utilizes um, a bed of sand within what would otherwise be the crawl space and insulated box there and then using solar heated fluid to um, pump heat into that mass on a, a seasonal basis. There are also uh, ways of integrating um, vents from the space down into the crawl space and then having a single powered vent uh, to exhaust that air and then um, being able to close off that one vent. We're employing that on a retrofit project right now. Um, better still is to have unvented roofs. And uh, these are some that we've used in, in our projects as well. Um, here's one where we have the exposed um, metal eave. And underneath that is a wrap of stone wool. Um, not only in the roof, but also on the walls here. So providing a separation between the sheathing and the waterproofing on the roof or the sheathing and the weather barrier along the walls um, before we have, in this case, a fiber cement uh, finish on the exterior. So there's the mineral wool above the weather barrier and waterproofing on the side of the building. And then um, in this case, a fiber cement uh, board is being employed as the exterior finish, a non-combustible finish. Those wider gaps there actually have a little sheet metal flashing as well. So to summarize uh, vent recommendations, um, 
you want to try to remove combustibles. If you have existing vents, at least move to a one eighth inch vent uh, mesh or better still these ember resistant vents um, or better yet unvented altogether. Um, as a builder friend up in Lake County likes to say, if I had to choose one way to be fire resistant, I would choose a ventless attic and no crawl space venting. And uh, Dan noted that that would actually be more energy efficient as well. Okay, this brings us to our third survival story. This is one in uh, Santa Rosa, is, uh, near Sonoma, California, a uh, straw bale home uh, that was built in a beautiful uh, valley uh, above the town of Sonoma. And um, here the Norbaum fire, which was uh, which eventually merged with the nuns complex, um, burned right up to the foundation of the building. And uh, the combination um, here of a uh, unvented uh, structure, in this case slab on grade, um, and then the uh, natural hydraulic lime plaster finish on the straw bales and the deep recess on our windows all combined to protect the building. Um, on the left there is uh, the drain inlets, which our clients reminded me was something that the county insisted they uh, feature along the backside of the building. Those had been filled with leaves and uh, of course ignited. And you can see the plaster on the wall actually oxidated and turned a little bit uh, reddish. Our um, natural hydraulic lime specialist assured us that that was perfectly safe. And in fact, it's how they make red is by oxidizing it with heat. Um, one of the panes of glass in one of the windows broke out and there was some charring on a sliding shutter. Um, but you can see it reached the um, the roof eave there, which had the exposed metal and nothing uh, remarkably ignited. And um, as our homeowners uh, noted, um, it pretty much survived on its own. There were some patrols for hot spots, but uh, they are feeling very fortunate uh, to have their home survive. This brings us now to uh, various forms of siding options. And while um, you know, siding is often considered a lower priority, it still represents a vulnerability. And uh, especially if there's a radiant source, such as a neighbor or outbuilding close by. And again, that 30 foot rule is one to keep in mind. So if there's another structure within 30 feet, increasing the fire resistance of your siding is important. Uh, this is one um, project uh, site we visited post fire. This is a grass fire that burned up the side of a building and then the vinyl siding uh, ignited and brought flames and embers into the attic space, uh, resulting in a total loss. Um, in New York City, they monitored air quality from Western wildfires and picked up um, uh, the senses of, of a lot of these toxic materials being put into the air and transported across the country. Um, so, you know, avoiding these flammable and toxic materials is really important. It was the foam insulation that um, caused the Grunfels Tower Inferno in London uh, a couple of years ago. Um, one of the things we're employing in some of our most recent projects is a wrap of uh, stone wool along the lowest course of a building um, and then bringing um, some extremely non-combustible material over the top of that. Um, stone wool is particularly nice in this case because we can run it uh, below grade as well. So it's a continuous uh, insulation solution. Um, so for siding recommendations, I again uh, invite you to explore the wildland urban interface uh, list of approved systems. Um, Non-combustible materials of a variety of sources are out there. Um, with wood, it's important to have uh, ember resistant uh, lapping joints. Um, thermal uh, break between the sheathing and the siding uh, is recommended and uh, increasing the distance uh, from the ground as I was describing in the example uh, that we showed. Um, and then maintenance uh, of the siding is important to keep it uh, ember proof. 
want to, of course, touch on some of the natural building options that are available to us. And while testing hasn't specifically been done on some of these, they do represent um, very fire resistant options uh, to consider. One that has been tested and is probably our favorite tool in our toolbox when we're working in a high fire risk zone is to do some form of a plaster over a straw bale wall. Um, this was a test done many years ago uh, for the fire safety, establishing a two hour fire rating on a lime plastered uh, straw bale wall. Worth noting here is that over the first 30 minutes, while one side of the wall is being exposed to flame and 2,500 degrees, it took 30 minutes before the other side of the wall registered any change in temperature. And after an hour, only a 50 degree increase in the surface temperature. And that is perhaps one of my favorite reasons for looking to um, a straw bale wall system is the thermal mass effect and the slow transfer of heat from one side to the other. So in this uh, data logging of temperature, while the outside temperature is varied from 50 to 95 degrees, the inside temperature stayed very much within the comfort zone. And the center of that wall was actually at a 12 hour time lag to the interior and exterior extremes. I will not go into all of the benefits of straw bale construction, but do want to highlight um, the fact that it is a carbon storing material and that it can be part of a extremely fire resistant building system. Um, this is a rebuild uh, after the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. And here the straw is being coated with uh, a variation of rammed earth uh, sprayed on the building with guidenet equipment. So a very strong bond and very little um, air transfer once it's completed and quite a bit of thermal mass on the interior and a protective layer on the exterior. And that brings us to our next uh, survival story. This one in Lovell Valley, uh, which is Napa County, but accessed from the Sonoma side. And here is an outbuilding uh, actually designed by a structural engineering professor of mine, Gary Black at UC Berkeley. Here applying a gunite coating over straw bale um, and then a salvage steel sash window in this outbuilding. Um, here they had one of those absolutely do not do it. Uh, stacking firewood immediately adjacent to a building and not only right against the building, but underneath a window. Um, that stack of firewood burned. And as you can see, there is a, you know, extreme oxidation of the, the gunite uh, finish here, but remarkably no penetration of the window above, uh, partially because it's set in uh, 14 inches. And I think there was also quite a bit of absorption of the radiant heat and I think in a you know, block building or something, um, things on the interior might have picked up that heat, but the great absorption and yet lack of ignition due to lack of oxygen uh, protected this building. Which brings us to windows and um, shutters and other recommendations here. So utilizing tempered glass, um, having windows recessed where you can, and then non-combustible shutters, uh, something that is also good for solar control. Um, decks and fences represent one of the areas to the exterior of a building that can be a transfer of ignition to the building. And uh, worth noting is, you know, one of the best ways to deal with these is just simply not have them. So if there's a form of um, hardscape paving uh, a patio instead of a deck that can be featured around your building. Um, definitely look to that. It's also a lower maintenance solution typically. Uh, one thing we've started doing is actually separating the deck from the house uh, with some form of a patio between the two. Um, and uh, again, featuring heavy timber and a railing which is largely open uh, so that embers will blow right through rather than get caught on it. So just some of the recommendations here. Um, I wanna note, this is a photo I took after the um, Tubbs fire where the Douglas fir pressure treated uh, fence post was burned, but the redwood uh, fencing did not. And actually redwood and cedar achieve a class B uh, decking rating and with wider gaps and foil tape, 
between the um, decking and the joists. Um, that is a, and good maintenance, keeping those gaps clear of um, debris. Uh, that can be a mildly uh, fire resistant solution. However, there are times when um, that uh, shower of embers and a forest worth of radiant heat is coming at a building and you really need to step up the game. Uh, for one of our clients, this meant a landscape around their building that was just gravel for 30 feet in all directions, plus a very large defensible zone. Um, very fire resistant materials. What looks like wood is actually a stained fiber cement. And uh, you nurtured a good relationship with the fire department. So they actually go there and camp when there's a fire in the region. Um, if there's time, you know, deploying foil wrap was able to save a cabin up in the Sierras where all of the neighboring cabins burned. Another client of ours is utilizing a sprinkler system that can be activated remotely with, um, with his phone uh, and they can keep an eye on if the fire is approaching and when to take best advantage of their stored fire water. Um, and that's the project where that is being implemented. So um, be prepared. Uh, know that the fire is coming and that not every building is uh, going to survive under the worst of conditions. Um, and there are a lot of resources on the website web about how to prepare adequately. Um, this brings us to our third survival story and um, one that is uh, detailed in that same um, 2018 fine home building article. A client of ours who was trapped in his home um, tried to escape, uh, met the neighbor at the top of the hill whose home was on fire they were going to go down the driveway but the pump shed ignited so went back took refuge in the home um, it is a straw bale home uh, with some details that are worth mentioning a porch that wraps all the way around uh, columns that are heavy timber and in this case the ventilated roof uh, intake is above the porch rather than underneath its eaves uh, he and the neighbor watched the his steel uh, container power building uh, burn, but they survived the night. Um, interesting to note that the redwood columns here had been harvested from a previous wildfire. And uh, we wonder if that pre-charring, um, maybe similar to the Japanese technique of Shosiguban wasn't uh, at work in their uh, survival. Uh, just a few thoughts on rebuilding uh, based on not only our own experience, but working with uh, clients um, in rebuilding fire zones. This is the Ursuline neighborhood, uh, Mark West Springs, north of Santa Rosa. And uh, some counties have created a very uh, comprehensive and uh, good um, recovery websites and resources that are available to you. So we really encourage you to look into those. I will say though, that we've worked in other places where they just haven't gotten organized yet or they don't have um, the, the resources available. So it does vary from place to place. Um, in our particular you know, cleanup effort, we chose to um, do a private cleanup uh, so we could keep our foundation. Uh, structural engineer came out, tested it, uh, approved it for um, maintaining. We did the cleanup ourselves and got a clean bill of health. So while our foundation tested out okay, and we did that largely to save on the carbon as well as uh, quite a bit of cost uh, had we been replacing it, even a damaged foundation can be left. Um, however, many places offer um, cleanup and debris and foundation removal by FEMA. Um, unfortunately, what we found is they also take quite a bit of soil out of a site. And depending on the specifics, um, that is something that has to be factored back into the reconstruction. Our resiliency center in uh, Sonoma County is quite amazing. They promised a plan check response within five days. And uh, in the case of the plan check for this um, straw bale rebuild, we received an approved building permit in three days, uh, shattering the previous record of three weeks. Um, so uh, kudos to the Resiliency Center in Sonoma for their quick response. Um, speaking of resiliency, it's worth noting that um, featuring a renewable energy system with 
Um, battery backup uh, can be an important part of a rural property. Um, here in California and in other places, we're experiencing public safety power shutdowns where our local utility will cut off the electricity grid. So if you have PV with battery backup, you can not only keep your phone charged and the lights on, but you know, keep the refrigerator and the freezer uh, going at the same time. And of course, you know, it's providing electricity the rest of the year as well. Uh, for our own rebuild, um, we'll be taking a number of measures that I've talked about here today um, in order to you know, create uh, what we hope will be an extremely uh, fire resilient as well as a uh, comfortable um, uh, place for the long term. I just wanna wrap up by um, touching on a few points that are important to uh, all of our work as builders, whether we, we're building or rebuilding in fire zones or anywhere else. Um, you know, the, the reduced energy use of a building starts with its passive solar considerations, um, understanding orientation and the climate that you're working in, local available resources, and then coupling that with net zero carbon strategies that uh, can reduce the building's footprint and actually uh, limit our impact on um, the climate change or actually begin to reverse it. And buildings do account for 50% of the um, carbon emissions uh, here in the US and a good sector of that uh, belongs to the embodied carbon of construction materials, transportation and building activities. We are on a path to achieve the 65% um, reductions in our carbon emissions by 2030 and ultimately zero emissions by 2040. Um, so the good news is we are doing this work. It's largely been bigger architecture firms working on uh, larger projects. We need to bring this to the low rise uh, construction community. And my colleague, Chris Magwood has done some great work in that. We contributed to the carbon smart materials palette and just wanna note that there are a lot of emerging carbon storing materials and building systems that are available to us. And I invite you to understand the uh, Buildings for Climate Action um, beam estimator, which helps us to uh, understand the carbon impacts of our small scale buildings. Just to wrap up with a couple of uh, quotes here, we have um, you know, the potential of every acre to burn, uh, not only here in California, but throughout the West and throughout the world. And it really does rely on paying attention to the small details and proper maintenance. Um, as a, a friend like to say, life is maintenance. And uh, that couldn't be more true here today. People are gonna wanna continue to live in beautiful places. And I think we can find ways to build in harmony with those places to manage the landscape, actually bring back um, controlled burns as a form of reducing the fuel load that has led to a lot of these devastating conflagrations that we're seeing and actually live in harmony um, and safely uh, in these beautiful places. Uh, so thank you all. And I think Rob, we're gonna take it to some discussion and maybe some questions that have been uh, received during the chat here. Yes, uh, thank you, David, for that. Pretty amazing presentation. I mean, uh, it's obvious. You mentioned you you put a lot of time into it before we were talking, and uh, it's very obvious. It's uh, it was very eye opening to me to see, you know, what what can happen and what what we can do to avoid avoid these problems. Uh, let's go ahead and bring Rick back so he can have a talk with us too. Uh, hey, Rick. Thanks. Welcome. Welcome. Excellent presentation, David. Congratulations. Thank you. So now I've just got a quick question. You mentioned that uh, people should be reaching out to those those codes uh, that, that California has in place about the, uh, the the zones that are that are at risk. And uh, wh why do you think it's it one taken so long? If fi wildfires have always been a thing for that that to be a thing in California, and why it's uh, you know why it's not not in in some of the adjacent states that have just as high wildfire risks. Um, 
I'm not sure I'm in a good position to answer that because I'm not in those other states. Um, but I knew there's been a lot of discussion in Colorado in particular, um, where we're doing that one project of introducing similar codes. Um, part of it is that those places um, historically haven't had the sorts of wildfires that they're now seeing. So I think they are coming to, to realize that they are just uh, as a risk as we are here in California. And I expect that they will look to a lot of the lessons that have been learned here over the last 20 years. But, uh, you know, as, as I saw with that wildfire in Oakland um, uh, 25 years ago, we quickly changed how we do vegetation management here in the East Bay, and it's made a difference. We haven't had a fire like that since. So and, you know, I couldn't uh, understate how important vegetation management and defensible space are uh, to this equation. Yeah. Now, Rick, in your, in your work, you actually do deal with, uh, with codes. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how this stuff has been changing and how you guys have been influencing it? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that I think part of the reason why uptake uh, into your original question has, has been sort of um, spotty is because I, I think that there, you need quite a lot of a like holistic understanding of how these things come together before you can make, you know, you know hardening of building a, a practical solution. But like one of the things that 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 we try, have recently tried to address is the fact that you know in in the WUI regulations, be it the International Wildland Urban Interface Code or uh, Chapter Seven A, um, is it, when it comes to certain provisions in the in the regulations, it, it's not they don't always do the same things. Even though you, you may have a few different options on how to achieve something, they may not be aligned in in what they actually do. I'll give you an example. Um, when it comes to the exterior wall uh, provisions in, in the WUI codes, is you know like some some have to do with flame impingement or fire resistance into an assembly, and thereby protecting the occupants. And some directly or indirectly have have to do with reducing the amount of flame spread across a surface. And you have you have like five six different options, but they, they'll do one or the other. And one of the efforts that we've tried to make recently is that both need, both are important. So you need some sort of measure of flame impingement to protect your occupants, but you also need to prevent flames from spreading across the surface and then thereby potentially letting other aspects of the building on fire. Uh, and, and not to go into too much detail there, but, but like, I'll give you an example, like one hour fire resistance rating. It, it's good. It's an important thing because it protects the occupant on the inside, but it doesn't say anything about what you put on the outside. So despite the fact that you might have a fire resistance rating from the exterior, it doesn't, it, you could have very flammable materials across the surface and thereby your, your, your fire has moved to a, a different part of your building and despite the, that you've met the code. So two things need to happen there at once as an example. Okay, great. Now, David, you mentioned in your presentation, just in passing, talking about a retrofit. Um, I, I mean, obviously, we're um, you know, a lot. A lot of the examples we're showing here were were homes that were built from the start. To, uh, I mean, uh, I, I imagine a lot of people who would live in existing homes are afraid of these these things happening to their own homes. And and is it a, is it more challenging? Do you do you have any recommendations for people who are thinking about retrofits? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, one of the examples that I shared was a 100-year-old Victorian up near uh, Healdsburg uh, here in Northern California. And there we um, did a wrap of the exterior with uh, stone wool, um, took out the old windows and actually brought new ones in from the exterior, had them matched to the um, trim uh, on the interior. So you had no idea that it was not the original window, um, and then clad it in a fiber cement of a similar um, bevel lap uh, pattern as the original had, but in a more non-combustible material. And then the attic there um, was retrofit with one of these uh, intumescent paint vents. Uh, so it still has a ventilated attic, uh, but it's ember protected. So yeah, um, 
that's you know one example of it. Uh, another project we did, we actually wrapped a ranch style home with straw bales uh, to create a you know better insulative envelope on that building, but also a very fire resistant uh, solution. Because in that case, the windows were still you know. 16 inches back from the surface of the wall. And as we saw with the one example, that can make a really big difference. Great. Now, before, um, before we were using stone wool or other similar materials for fire resistance in the exterior homes, were, was exterior insulation sort of, is that one of the main reasons why you see it using, using it on the exteriors because of the, the added benefit of fire safety? Because in your climate, I mean, I mean, because in your climate, sure, sure. I wouldn't think it would be as common as it would be up north. Um, well, actually, our energy codes here in California, except for the most mild zones, do require with two by six framing and cavity insulation that you have some form of a thermal break um, of the transfer of heat through the studs from the interior to the exterior. So maybe it's only an inch that you need. And uh, sort of one of our favorite tools in the toolbox right now uh, is cork. Um, there's also wood fiber. Uh, we like those that are because they're carbon storing and um, uh, effective at creating that, you know, radiant heat break as well as the thermal break. Um, but as I said in my, my presentation, stone wool is one of the tools in our toolbox because we can take it, you know, right down to grade and um, provide a continuous thermal break. Sure. So now a couple of people in the uh, chat had asked about this presentation yeah. being available afterwards. And, and uh, we've, we've put a link in there for anyone. Uh, we will be having a recording and all of the links to the um, resources that we all mentioned here today so that everyone can, uh, can check back and, and dig in a little bit deeper or, or, or refresh you know, um, themselves about parts of the talk that they missed. Uh, but uh, how do you guys uh, feel that we, I mean, that we need to spread the word? Like, how can, how can we get more people to adopt the practices? I mean, obviously people are aware of the danger of this, but uh, how, we, how can we get more builders and more architects to sort of know about the, the best practices? Oh, you're on, you're on mute there, Rick. You'd think after so many Zoom calls, you wouldn't fall into that stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I think that uh, what, exactly what we're doing today is part of it. And I think we need to have a discussion and we need to be able to show people that there are solutions, that they're well thought out, they work. Um, and then helping people put things together. I think what, you know, the way David put this together, I think is, is great because it, it shows, okay, these are, these are the primary areas of concern. This is, these are some examples of what you could do. These are some examples of what have worked. And then it really gives people confidence. One of the things about the construction industry is that it's slow to adapt, but things are changing very quickly these days. And I think because of visionaries like David, um, we're, we're able to sort of you know, accelerate the, the, the path of progress. And, and it's a really encouraging thing. Uh, that is yeah, exciting. I think we could use the example of, you know, the wildland urban interface chapter seven, eight codes taking effect in California and our energy title 24 energy documentation codes it really reshaped how we build homes in particular. And um, I could see that the uh, embodied carbon impacts of our construction activities once that starts being uh, regulated will follow a similar path. Um, whether it's pricing or, you know, just mandating the use of, or, or, or more specifically limiting the use of high carbon emitting materials. Marin County, uh, one of the ones I mentioned, actually has a low carbon concrete um, building code now. I think another point uh, to make is that, um, uh, that the, the, the materials, I think there's something that could be exacerbating the, the the, the, let's say the rate of progress. And because continuous insulation is relatively new to the construction industry, as, at least in, in housing, um, it's prompting people to think about things a little bit differently than they did for the last 70 years. And so it's, it's forcing people to think a little bit differently, but at the same time, you have a, a sort of like a, a confluence of issues, which is energy conservation and also fire risk if you're in a fire prone area. And then how do you link those two up? 
I mean, it just prompts all these questions. How do I do this right? And I think prior to this zeitgeist, people weren't really thinking in innovative ways because it didn't have to. But now with the, like the, the, the requirement of continuous exterior insulation in, in a lot of areas and the, the fire component as well, it really forces you to think a little bit differently. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, you mentioned that uh, it has been accelerating and, and it, the knowledge about of these sorts of details. And, and I can even just say that from my own experience, because uh, I, you know, I started out with Green Building Advisor 12 years ago, when even to the people who were really interested in, in uh, details like this, uh, like exterior insulation, um, it was such a new thing to so many people back then. But now we can go anywhere in the country and talk to our our readers and they're at least familiar with, if not, uh, you know, uh, ex extremely experienced at, in, in using these details. So it, it is promising. But, uh, yeah, so now I think it's worth mentioning, it's exciting that we're creating better buildings. They're not only fire resistant, mm -hmm. but they're more comfortable and higher performing and uh, less expensive to operate. For sure. I did notice, guys, that we do have a bunch of questions piling up in the uh, Q and A chat uh, section. If there's, is there anything else you wanted to discuss before we start uh, going in onto the audience questions? I, I did notice a comment in the chat that um, certain counties have adopted fire safe ordinances, and that's um, you know interestingly that was the path that straw bale construction took to the building code which was that of a few you know counties and then i think it was the state of new mexico um offered guidelines and the state of california and then it you know made its way into the international residential code in 2015 so uh, local governments uh, you know who have experienced a wildfire like this um, are the ones who are going to take action but it really should be you know state and uh, federal level. Sure, that definitely makes a lot of sense, though, that uh, the people who are experiencing first hands are first hand are going to be the early adopters and uh, the examples to follow. So great. So uh, I'm going to go jump right into our Q&A box here. And uh, um, uh, uh, Bill asked, uh, David, have you eliminated rain screens as part of your fire resistance program? That's a great question. And I actually tuned into one of the uh, BS and beer shows recently when John Straub was on and there was a very long discussion uh, about rain screens and noting that, um, you know, they should be tuned to the climate. They are not a, you know, must do everywhere. If you're in a high moisture environment, they are extremely effective at moving moisture. But if you're not in a high moisture environment, they aren't so needed. Um, and so in a lot of our projects here in California, we don't. We use maybe a wrinkle wrap. So we get a little bit of a separation between the uh, underside of the sheathing and the or siding and the, and the sheathing and the wrap, but otherwise, no. Um, if you do have a rain screen, it's important to feature that uh, strip of ember um, barrier mesh and there are some products out there I forget what they're called um, so you don't have you know the potential or something to get drawn in there where you will find you know the potential for things touching each other to ignite um, but again I, I don't think it's uh, necessary in a lot of these places that we're talking about that makes sense I so think also just to add to that, if I could, uh, if if a rain screen is required or, or desired, then it's perfectly you're, it's perfectly possible to to build a rain screen system out of non combustible materials, and to to limit the ember entry, uh, but with all the components being non combustible, and from a stonewall perspective, as as I'm coming from, the the stonewall protects vulnerable aspects behind it, so the WRB or any kind of sheathing or or studs or what have you. Um, so, so there's an inherent fire resistance, uh, uh, characteristic to the stone wall itself. So if you have a non, uh, like a non-combustible cladding, non-combustible furring strips, non-combustible stone wall, and then anything behind it is, is thereby protected as well. Sure. That's a good point. Um, We've got a question from Mikey, who's actually one of our regular listeners, uh, who says hi, and also asks, uh, he's, he's not in a high risk zone himself, has some friends are who he's uh, sort of listening in to sort of pass some advice along, but 
he was asking if you're if you're in a place that's uh, not a high risk zone, are these things that we should still be thinking about? You know, but what is, are there measures we should be taking? Maybe not quite as extreme, uh, but uh, in 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 making our our home safe. Uh, certainly, I mean, in an urban environment, you can have a neighbor have an experience of fire, and so you know the potential for um, transfer is real. Uh, so, so yeah, I think there there are roles for these uh, systems to play. Um, the basic, you know, passive survivability things and energy efficiency things that we've been talking about apply everywhere. And I'd, I'd also add, uh, although I totally agree with David in all aspects, um, codes are also sort of slow to adapt. And there are these meta trends that, that creep up. And for example, in, in many urban areas, the, the lots stay the same, but houses are getting bigger. And, and so there's less space between them as, 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 sort of as a general trend. And the proximity from one house to another can pose uh, radiation related ignition and um, certain regulatory frameworks like the IRC, for example, aren't necessarily highly tuned for that sort of thing. And they, they permit many things that, that wouldn't be as good at, uh, at addressing that kind of risk. And I, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, and I forgot to mention this in my presentation, but you know, fire sprinklers systems are pretty much the rule now in all new residential construction out here. Um, the only exception is if you're building an ADU and a site where the main house is not fire sprinkler protected, you're not required to add that for the ADU and a few other building types. But basically all new residential construction will be fire sprinkler protected. And that includes not only the interior, but any exterior eave that's greater than five feet. Um, so that's a, a measure of protection in urban areas that we're seeing. Yeah. We had another attendee ask about, uh, you, you're mentioning running the stone wall, wall right down below grade and was wondering uh, if there's any concerns about insects or rodents. Do you run the metal down to grade? Uh, or you worry about you know, other materials that are covering the stone wall when you get down to grade? I'm going to let take that one pick, pick up after me. I'll just sure. take quickly that with our uh, project in Colorado, um, we worked with the builder and the local conditions to be ensured that that was going to be a viable solution there. Um, you know, that worked with their uh, freeze thaw and, and high, high snow load environment. Um, would it work everywhere? I'm not sure. We would want to take into consideration, you know, the, the local conditions before we employed that somewhere else. Yeah, picking up after David, which is my preferred way to go. Let's go with the, the great advice followed by the secondary advice. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I think we was, did the question also ask um, how to how to fasten them, or is it just more like uh, moisture? I think he was mostly just concerned with uh, you know the the uh, risk of having any particular materials below grade and whether whether there was a risk at all. You know. Well, I, there there are best practices. Uh, uh, when it comes, and it, of course, there are so many different regions within uh, the country. So, uh, but having free drain, free draining fill next to your continuous installation below grade is, that, that ties into a, a well properly designed uh, weeping tile system is 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 a very good way of uh, of mitigating that moisture, not allowing it to sort of uh, stay within, let's say, clay soil or something like that. So as long as it's free draining soil and tied to a, a system that's gonna be able to evacuate that water uh, works perfectly well, even in the most wet regions. Uh, when it comes to rodents, of course, you, you do have to design for that. And there are ways of doing it and not terribly unlike embers, for example, like you, you have you know, systems to be able to, to keep out rodents. One of them, one, an, in, an interesting one is termites and uh, continuous insulation and, uh, and um, I remember years ago, we, we hadn't yet done the testing and we, we assumed that stone would be a, a good candidate for that. And um, there are ASTM tests for that. And there happens to be one lab, as far as I can tell in the US that does it and it's in Hawaii. So we did that and um, 
and, and it's measured by tastes which termites will take and and uh, there's zero interest in stone wool even even in, in, in very distressed uh, conditions so so when it comes to uh, vermin and that sort of thing stone wool is, is very well you know suited for that Thanks, yeah, one of the things we've noted for a lot of our projects, especially slab on grade, where we don't have deep foundations because the soils uh, allow that, um, we'll actually take advantage of the thick straw bale wall and put a thermal break of insulation um, in between the outer stem wall and the toe of the slab on grade. So providing that separation in a location where, you know, you've got the concrete footing on the exterior um, protecting protecting it completely. So, you know, all of those concerns go away. Okay, great. Um, we have another attendee who says he's kind of on a different difficult site with um, trees that are tall, uh, that are down slope, but uh, in a zone that he's not allowed to clear. And uh, it's a steep slope. And he was saying, how can I manage zone three protection if I can't get permission to clear trees and brush that are too close to my house? I guess that's a little outside of the architectural discussion here, but uh, is that something he has to take up with uh, it, with local officials, or is that something that uh, that's just really sort of not an option? Yeah, the, the, that is a tough one, and you know I've got a little scar tissue because when we logged after our first fire, we were not allowed to do any logging in what was deemed a gully riparian zone, even though it was not. <laughs> um, and that's the direction the fire came from. Um, and we were hit by all those embers that might have been from further away. I don't know if it would have made a difference. Um, how do you get permission to do that? And, uh, and, and short of that permission, you know, hardening your home with some of these extreme measures that we talked about today is probably your first best move. But uh, ultimately, um, you know, work with those officials, whoever's managing that land to help them realize that, you know, you are at risk and everything on their land is at risk. And maybe a controlled burn to remove the understory and limb up within your zone is something that can be negotiated. I don't know. I don't know the specifics here, but I would do all you can to employ these things for all the reasons we just talked about. Sure. Um, we we're get a bunch of questions about exterior cladding and and just materials in general because uh, you were talking about obviously metal and heat resistant uh, undercoatings and exterior insulation that's fireproof. Um, there were people asking about you know stucco versus hard coat versus acrylic, fiberglass windows, metal siding versus fiber cement. I mean, can you kind of kind of talk to like it's, it's like wait. How much does this come up in your discussions with your clients? Because obviously these are these are aesthetic choices as well as they are fire safety or durability choices. And how do you address those sorts of concerns? Sure, I I did read um, that there is uh, a hardened vinyl window. Um, I forget what it was. Some internal structure that needs to be a part of it. You know. We haven't used a vinyl window in 20 years. So, um, you know, that's just not something that I keep up to speed on. And I will admit that our, you know, palette is, is somewhat limited to the materials that I talked about, but there are, you know, others out there. I'm not sure any type of, you know, IFAS system is going to achieve the, the um, you know, uh, fire resistance, but it may. Um, I'm just not a system I'm, I'm familiar with. I would again point folks towards that wildland urban interface uh, approved material list that the state of California fire marshal has created because it describes a lot of the things that I'm not aware of that um, you know they see as a fire resistant exterior cladding system. Right. Yeah, I, I would uh, echo that. I think that's a really good place to start with, with the Cal Fire listing. Um, there's all kinds of different products in there, um, including Stonewall. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think, so prescriptive, thinking about things prescriptively is one way of doing it and it, it can be helpful. The other one is to take a more uh, a fire testing approach. And uh, there are, so in, within the California 
regulations, the, the SFM standards, uh, the state fire marshal standards that were developed, geez, I, I suppose in the, in the 80s, I believe. I know some of the folks that were involved in that. Um, so there's SFM standard 127A1, which is the exterior siding and sheathing one. And, and it's, a, it's a line burner uh, at, at a fairly decent exposure, 150 kilowatts. And it, and it, and it assesses a system's ability to withstand that assault going past the sheathing. So that's kind of like a, a flame impingement type of assessment. It's adapted into ASTM as ASTM 2707. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways of doing that. For example, you could, uh, you could try to evaluate whether, uh, you know, like if, if you would prefer a metal system, which, which doesn't actually prevent heat very, like from transferring very well, because it's very conductive. Um, but it doesn't burn. So, so that's one aspect of it. Um, a cement board, strictly speaking, uh, isn't always um, non-combustible by ASTM 136, but nevertheless, it performs very well. So, so there are a few things that you could do. And, and one of the things that, that E2707 or that SFM 7A1 standard will do is it will you can assess a system's ability to withstand that assault going inwards, but it's also giving an indication for flame propagating upwards and laterally. So, so these are some ways of doing that. And also just uh, to, to your EFS point, uh, Stonewall makes, an, like uh, the, we, we have an EFS system out of Stonewall as well with rendering and stucco solutions. So um, they, they're, they're off the shelf, and, um, and, and uh, they've been proven for, for worth in these kinds of applications. So. Oh, that's good to know. I hadn't, I hadn't seen that before. Uh, is, that, is that something we can put a, add a link to from, um, from your website perhaps, or, uh, or, or find some documentation you know, of that? I, I don't have that information. I'm not really in the, in the product side. I'm the reg okay. regulatory we side. Could, so. We could just make a note to, to, to search it because I'm going to add a lot, all, all the things that we've talked about, what we can go ahead and add to the uh, webinar page uh, later on. And uh, people can kind of check back in when the video is live to, um, to find those. Yeah, um, and I don't, I don't know as there aren't synthetic stucco and foam insulation um, systems that are fire rated, but they are just so far from a product that we would touch that I just don't know. Uh, somebody did ask about the clarification, clarification about the mentioning, uh, descri describing the product as, as stone wool. And I know we had this discussion before the webinar about how uh, the, there's some technical subtleties about, about uh, product naming. Can you, can you talk, speak to that, Rick? Sure. Yeah. Um, the, the general classification for the type of product is called mineral wool. In the U.S., mineral wool is bifurcated into two subcategories. In, in other parts of the world, it goes into three, but for the U.S., it's two. And it's uh, primarily made out of stone or primarily made out of slag. Slag is a, uh, a, a byproduct of the steel or like a smelting industry byproduct and it's sort of reused into that aspect and and, and stone um is uh, is made primarily out of um out of stone with with some um, slag added to it for its recycled content so that's really how it goes uh we we Rockwell makes a stone wool product uh, because of the, the fine tuning for the fiber chemistry that we rely on for fire safety so that's that's why we do it that way because it's really the, one of the most important things that we try to achieve. Great. I um, learned something. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. I've been learning all the session. Ditto. Um, we have had a couple questions about uh, you had mentioned uh, renewable energy, you know, solar, solar power being a safety uh, benefit on, uh, especially on remote places during during events like this uh, and uh, can you speak to or, or do you even know uh, so anything about sort of like placement or even material choices like our solar panels uh, holding up in, in in these kinds of fire events um, yeah great question um, you know the uh, top side of a PV panel is glass the underside is typically a vinyl coating adhesive that holds the photovoltaic, you know, the silicon cells uh, 
uh, up to it. Um, so on a rooftop array, um, it's actually important to block the lower edge so you don't have an ember you know, charge or flame or heat running in between the panel and the roof surface. Heat can get trapped there and it can you know, start to melt and ignite um, that vinyl coating. When they're ground mounted or on a carport or out in a field, what's generally been observed is that the winds just blow right through it. Unless there's a high fuel load underneath those panels, they're likely not going to invite, uh, uh, ignite. Okay. Yeah, and further to that, uh, one of the systems that we do promote for that uh, is, is because it's hard to, it's hard to maintain some of these things. And, and if they do ignite, um, we, uh, they, it, it's difficult to put out because they're live products. And so you're not gonna wanna put water onto an electrical sure. fire. Um, so the, those panels are combustible and they can burn quite readily. Uh, so a non-combustible roof covering with stone wool underneath. Um, so you get your energy and your fire protection of, of, the, of the structure. Um, as, as it might burn down towards the structure. Another thing to think about from a roofing perspective is, uh, and it's, it's written in, in vague terms, but, but it, it's in there um, that the, any gap that exists between the, 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 the class A roof covering and, um, and the insulation below needs to be bird stopped. Um, so to, as to prevent uh, embers from going into that space. And uh, that's another good a um, uh, way of hardening the building with, let's say, a steel roof, purlins, stone wool underneath, and, uh, and, and so that non-combustible dyad. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the one thing, I think one of the big things I learned from this is, is how I never would have imagined that a fire can sort of move over certain structures, even if there is some, some slight risk, but, you're, but basically by the way the wind moves through and across the buildings, that's, that's a major, it seems to be a major component of the safety factors here too, right? And, and also it's interesting that it, it's, it's a changing phenomena. It can, it, can, it can present itself in different ways at different times and change all the time. So for example, it could start off as embers and then it could ignite something within your, your, your zone one or two or three, and then it becomes a, uh, like a localized flame exposure against the building. Or, or the deck or what have you. So, so it, it's not always embers and it can change from embers to something else. And then there's another area which is not very well, I think understood, I think is the correct way of saying it, is that pre-radiation of building components, so a long uh, uh, gradual ra radiation exposure will, will, will sort of prime materials for ignition at, 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 a, at a lower at a, in a lower in, in a way that would be easier to ignite than if it wasn't pre-radiated, and there's unfortunately the the standardization work hasn't really caught up to that phenomenon yet. Uh, but uh, but that that is an issue that I think that we could look further into. Hmm. So that would come into play with uh, you could distance to adjacent structures and and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't say enough about defensible space and having observed, you know, one building where it just, there happened to be this ladder of combustible material that reached it and that was that. And another, which is, a, you know, an old barn, but it happened to be surrounded by a landscape of gravel and stone walls and the combination of those kept, you know, the, the fire moving along the ground plane from reaching it and it survived, even though it had, you know, board and bat and siding that, you know, could have easily received an ember and a lot of other details that you say, how did that survive? But it did, it did. Yeah. Uh, somebody brought up a question and I, I kind of had this in the back of my head when you were talking about these details. Uh, um, they were talking more about, I think the sort of the durability if they don't hit a fire event, but uh, intumescent coatings or materials. Um, do they keep their fire safety uh, qualities over time? Uh, and, and, and what do you have to do? I mean, it, it, obviously you, you, these are sort of uh, place, parts of the house that you have to replace if, in, in the case of them actually taking uh, action against the fire, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that when we had looked at them for um, coating exterior um, 
materials, you know, the, the eave rafters and other things that, you know, general feeling from building officials is, well, if you don't redo that on a regular basis, it's not going to maintain its protection. So we're not going to allow you to do that. And I thought it was actually a very reasonable thing for them to suggest is that, no, it's not going to hold up. So don't do it. Um, it's a great question about these venting uh, solutions. And do they have a lifespan? I don't know. Um, I'm going to go look into that because I think it's an important question. You know, are, are you protected for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, but not 50 or you do only get five and then you have to replace them? It's a great question. Yeah. Another thing about uh, intumescence is that I, I think that they, they, they may have applications in certain aspects, but uh, I think weather, weathering uh, is a challenge. Um, and also, uh, they're sometimes finely tuned to the to the the fire test test methods and the standardized fire exposure, like the, for example, e EASTM E119, the time temperature curve. And it's designed to initiate intumescence at a specific point. And not all fires are characterized that way. Like for example, we were talking about with pre radiation. If it doesn't, if it if it doesn't get struck by that that energy in in precisely that way in some cases it it may not intumesce at all and so so there's some questions about, around that okay um, we had another question about uh are insurance companies recognizing any of these fire safety practices or materials so they do they add any value or take reduce any uh people's uh you know cost you know, if hmm. we know about this stuff or? Great question. I was at a um, straw building conference a few years ago and they had some insurance company representatives there. Um, and, you know, they were receptive to hearing, you know, what the, what the capabilities were. I think the big, you know, change for us was getting straw bale into the building code. And once it's a code recognized solution, they sort of, it's, I don't think it's so much on their risk um, analysis. It's more, you know, like wooey, they make a map and you're either in the map or you're out of the map. And, you know, it's, it's generally done with a, a broader brush, um, but it could be, I, I would welcome it for sure. Yeah. I can imagine it, it could look something like, uh, how the fortified home systems, uh, you know, are, are being pushed to people who are in high wind zones. And, uh, and I think a lot of those kinds of programs are driven by the insurance companies. So it, it would actually be great to see the insurance companies even getting involved in the education on, on this sort of thing. Yeah, or if your, your home is built you know, to these new standards as opposed to one that's 40 years old, you know, maybe it can still be insured. I mean, for a lot of these places, they're just not. Uh, California had to establish a new fair program for uh, sites where nobody, no private insurance company will touch it. I've heard the same thing. I know. So, so f my response is a little bit more speculative, uh, but, uh, but I have heard that insurance companies are increasingly skeptical about insuring folks in these areas. Uh, but I think if, in terms of the rebuild strategies, there, there have been um, some devastating wildland urban interface fires where the rebuild was done to like in the exact same way as they, as, as they were before the fire. And so it, it's astonishing to me that, that there aren't a, a, as many sort of efforts made to, to, to adhere to the regulations as they exist now, as, as much as they could be, be improved, but at least start there. Yeah, there are certainly insurance companies that for, you know, a certain, you know, level of coverage will send out a private firefighting crew or they will, you know, deploy a foil wrap or, you know, things like that. Um, so I'm sure you pay for that type of coverage, but, um, you know, they've, those companies are realizing money spent protecting a property is, is money well spent. Um, I think for our own rebuild, we're going to assume that we might not get insurance or we might not get very good insurance. So we, in the way that we rebuild is our insurance. 
Okay. Well, we've covered quite a few questions here and gone, gone on for a while here, but uh, I want to maybe get to one more before we before we go. Uh, we have a graduate student exploring the question: What influences does social capital have on a community's ability to adapt to wildfire-related social and ecological changes? Because I imagine when we get deep into some of these areas, you've got you've got a mix of rural communities uh, who are or have just been there forever, and you've got uh, weekend homes and second homes and uh and and i imagine there's there's a different ability to sort of approach or deal with those things have you kind of have you seen any have you had any experience uh, dealing with that or, or thinking about that david um well we certainly saw it in uh here in california with um, a lot of the communities that, that have been devastated that you know resources from around the state have been brought to these areas to try to uh, recover, uh, help with the recovery for everyone who lives there, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, we are seeing it. I think, you know, federal dollars uh, have gone towards uh, this. Um, there, I, I can see that there are, you know, extreme examples where you just have, you know, communities living in poverty and, and they're very, it's very difficult to, um, rebuilt in those places and all the more important that some of these, you know, simple, affordable techniques, and I, I would push the natural building techniques, ones where you can engage the community in building. Um, a few weeks ago, we hosted a demonstration of a portable watershed block making machine, uh, which they will and intend to deploy in paradise uh, to help with some of the community rebuilding efforts there. Um, so, you know, as I said, when we talked about um, community adaptation, work together, you know, and we're all in this together. For sure. All right. Well, uh, I think that's about all we have time for today. Uh, do you guys have guys have any uh, final comments before we uh, we head out? I just wanted to thank everybody for participating. It was it's great to see the the uptake. I mean, the enthusiasm for the subject clearly it's very close to people's hearts and minds. And and from a Rockwell perspective, thank you so much to David and and to Fine Whole Building for putting this together. I mean, this is uh, I think this has been a terrific uh, experience. I hope others do. I'm glad you're recording it, and I hope, I'm glad you're disseminating it. So from from us, thank you very much. Great. Well, as I said at the outset, this is just an extremely important topic and it's not limited to how we rebuild in wildfire zones, but it's how we build generally on a planet with a changing climate and can buildings be part of that climate solution. And um, I did notice that the chat was active as I predicted it would be and recognized a few names of clients and old colleagues. And it's wonderful that uh, so many people joined us today. So thanks to everyone who's participated. And Rick, great to meet you. Learned a few things. Um, and I know there's a lot more to learn. And Rob and Fine Home Building, thanks for hosting a great talk here. It's, it's been our pleasure. I, I definitely learned a lot and I'm sure our, all of our participants or attendees did too. And uh, I want to thank you, David, for such a great presentation. And uh, Rick and Rockwell, I want to thank you for, uh, for sponsoring this and making it possible so we could spread the word. And again, I, I mentioned earlier that this, if you go to findhomemillion.com slash webinars, in a couple of days, we'll have the recording live of this event and we'll be sure to add any of the links to any of the, of the, um, resources that we talked about and, and feel free to reach out to us on uh, either to Rockwell or to find home building on social media if you have any more questions about any of the topics we discussed. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Take care. Take care everybody.